Gentlemen, today we have with us our regional director, who on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen will present to our colleague, Officer Widall, um, the Imperial Service Medal. Before he does so, I would like to acquaint you with his service to the Crown. Officer Widall joined the Royal Air Force in 1937 until 1945 and came out with the rank of sergeant. He then joined the prison service here at Manchester in 1952 until he was promoted in August of 68 as a senior officer. He has now been disestablished and re-engaged as an officer here at this prison. I will now ask the regional director on behalf of Her Majesty to present the Imperial Service Medal to Mr. Widall. Thank you very much. Very well deserved honour. Thank you. I hope you'll appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Right, done that. Right. Right, right, shot. Days, miss. I get a to you, let's... Turnkey, jailer, warder, screw. Names that generations of prisoners have given to the prison officer, as he is officially known. Traditionally, prison officers have been wary and suspicious of the world outside the jail. They have not come to expect sympathy or understanding from society, which still demands imprisonment for those deemed to threaten it. It is the nature of their unique job. They are men who lock other men away. <laughs> to control the average daily prison population of 1,600, over 250 officers are required in strange ways. There is an obvious parallel between them and the services, with their uniforms, discipline, camaraderie, and command structure. The blue shirt denotes the status of the basic grade prison officer. There are some 200 known as blue collars. Then there are four grades, from senior officer to chief officer one. Their status is made plain by their white shirts. They are known as white collars. Now, while you're in the service, or well, certainly whilst you're under training, you are, a mem you are under the Official Secrets Act, which simply means whatever you see or hear in this establishment is not passed on to anywhere else. So whatever you see or hear, and you go out at night with your wife or your friends for a drink, be extremely careful who is next door to you. Because it might be a reporter looking for a story. And you are going to give them one. So whatever you see or hear in this place, keep it to yourself. The other thing is, while you're here, start the way you mean to go on. Inmates are human beings, and they must be treated like human beings. But you are authority, and you must exert your authority. Your job, from now on, 
is to care for people. Now, let me say quite frankly to you, if you think you've come to the prison service to lock people up and lock, unlock people, then you're in the wrong job. We are not here to lock people up or to unlock them. We are here to care for them and to look after them and see that they have what they are entitled to and help them wherever we can. That is your, going to be your job for the next 30 odd years. That is what we are going to train you for. I mean, I don't come to this place and try to be Mr. Wonderful and get people to like me. I don't come here. I come here to lock them up, and they know that. Now, I try and do my job. If a bloke doesn't like it, that's his problem. It's not my problem. Because he's the person who got himself into this jam, not me. So he's got to put up with it. A lot of the tasks are, uh, could be classed as mundane, really. Patrolling a wing, where you're not really doing a lot, you're walking about. Um, issuing mail, collecting mail, issuing newspapers, slopping people out, taking people to classes, taking people to be seen by the governor. And it's not sort of difficult, but it's time consuming. It can be very frustrating when everybody wants somebody at once and you're trying to find somebody and someone else is using him. So it, you can be doing a lot of running about and getting nowhere. So it's, it can be difficult. Uh, other days, you can, you can have a nice, easy day, as it were, when nothing much happens and then something happens. You may get an alarm bell, you may get a, an officer assaulted, you may get prisoners fighting. You just never know what can turn up. So. There is some interest. How can you honestly rehabilitate a man who's been coming here before I was born and had every professional advice and help from teachers, doctors, psychiatrists to help him in his younger age, when he was younger, in Borstal, DC, and they expect us, which we have to do, try and help and instill some sort of discipline in these people. Very, very difficult. A thankless job. If somebody wanted, uh, from the outside world, as I call it, if they said to me, uh, what can we do to help uh, in this treatment and training? I would say this. Just leave us alone. Just leave the professionals. And that is what we are. Just leave us to do our job. And generally, I think we've been presented in a bad light. I don't know why because I believe the, the prison officer is a, an ordinary sort of bloke, perhaps a little more law-abiding. He's a taxpaying, rate-paying citizen. He does believe in freedom. He does believe in right and wrong. And I think it shows he knows that society is being threatened. And it's now and again, all right, he, he may turn out, he may seem to be a little bit on the harsh side, but I think it's just a backlash against the the do-gooders and the left-wing MPs who seem to have the whip hand at the moment and have had for a few years now. And don't forget, the people that we're controlling have failed in, to live in a normal society. But they will not fail in our society because we will exercise control and discipline which always sounds like a dirty word to the people outside. We will exercise control and discipline and we will ensure that they will behave themselves in here. With various allowances, blue collar officers can on average earn over 8,000 a year. But this is dependent on at least 13 hours overtime a week. Senior officers and principal officers earn about 10,000 a year with a similar amount of overtime. Chief officers, 11,000. But there has been a growth of discontent felt by some basic grade prison officers, which has led to the possibility of a breakaway blue-collar union. This has not gone unnoticed by the number one prison officer in Strangeways, Chief Officer Rowlandson. 
His first loyalty is to the governor, the second to the officers he commands. His prime duty, the smooth running of the prison. The chief is still a member of the POA, the prison officers' union, despite being part of the senior management in the prison. Seen here with the governor is Principal Officer Brian Baldwin, the chairman of Strangeways branch of the Prison Officers Association. Baldwin is concerned at the threat that a breakaway blue-collar union presents to the POA. John Sutton is the man at the centre of this challenge to the local prison establishment. His career and reputation are now on the line. Sutton's task is a formidable one, to convince enough blue-collar officers at Strangeways and other prisons that their best interests lie with him and a new union. And in 1980, compulsory overtime, in my opinion, is absolutely out the window. It's a quarter to eight in the morning till nine o'clock at night on a bank holiday. Absolute rubbish. Are you trying to tell me that that's reasonable? I was Charles Dickens wrote books about that. Well, John, I, look, I'm, I, I've told you before, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with this. I mean, I'm a white colour and I'm, I'm prepared to go in another union. Well, you can't feel your representative. And, and, and I would say that, but mm. your line of argument to, to uh, Harry yeah. now there's nothing to do with the difference between white collar and blue collar. You're talking about, about the EC, the the which has got blue collars on it. What man in his right mind can be expected to start work at seven o'clock in the morning and work till half past five and to be told that you get paid eight and three quarter hours when we have civilians who can come in here and work on flexi hours, providing that in between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. will get paid for every hour they're in the establishment. You can't blame the... NEC for that. You can only blame us. We can blame We you. have accepted exactly. that. Exactly. It's up to us point, to change You've got it. to be represented. Now, I don't feel that the management well, team I, can represent you. Yeah, 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 this has got nothing to do with white collar and blue collar. No. You're expressing dissatisfaction no, with the POA. Way. When Aren't people you? sit down at a negotiating table, and they've got to feel they've got the strength of the movement behind them. Now, if you've got management team members <laughs> sitting down negotiating on behalf of the workers, it just is not going to happen, is it? You've got you to talk about you talk about white collars and all that, and you're on about <coughs> we have white collars here on our branch. Yeah. Who elected them? When Come on, wait a minute, who elected them? The, the membership of this shop, and right. most of them blue collars. Yeah. Exactly. The vast exactly. majority. Most of them, the vast, a vast majority, probably so about 300 out of 360. I voted for them. I voted for the white collars. Yeah. 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 The white yeah. collars. Yeah. Because the men here, Baldwin and Elliot, have represented me in the past 18 months, unbelievably, far more than what I would have ever envisaged. They've been marvellous. But obviously, the problem comes here when they're like puppets for the NEC. They, when the Bo chairman Bowen came back and said at the meeting here, when he turned around and said he'd never seen such a carve up in his life regarding the meeting that went on, the special delegates meeting, he actually said he, in all his years of experience he was disgusted with the NEC. That's from our chairman. And I believe him. So it changed the NEC. You see, you don't that's need to bring it. I agree, door, I you? agree, but the problem you, is the Britain When you put other management men up there as well, you can't do it. In my opinion, you've got to have the workers well, represented. Yeah, the well, what's going on? Your, your NEC well, would be, in effect, be blue collar. They would all be blue collar. Well, Speaking and from a blue collar point of view, not from a management point of view. They're going to guarantee you that you'll get the representation that you want. I can guarantee you this, can mister, you? that the bloody management can't possibly purport to represent the workers because they're so far removed from the workers and they've got positions of authority to protect within the management infrastructure of this department that they are totally incapable of seeing the problems that we are faced with on the, sh on the shop floor. So so they, and they've never worked They've never worked They've allowed this change. They've allowed this job to deteriorate over the last hey, five years. Hey, so you're been just blaming. What's about. all this about the workers in the shop floor? That has got political overtones, as far as I'm concerned. Are you not saying that I'm political? We're not talking about politics now. I'm no, saying that the, 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 man so the, the workers no, on the shop no, floor, no, us, no. we are the only no, we're people. Not, we're not. We're in a unique job, different from an outside. Are you saying that the fire brigade, they've got to work in a very close-knit team. Now, they have got individual representation for the basic fire grade officers. Yeah. Now, Mr. Scott was a fireman. Did it work? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, of course it'll, it'll, it'll work. Well, Nobody's right. anti-management. I'm not anti-management. All I'm saying and is managers manage, workers work. And I think yours would work. Yeah. And it yeah, will you work. Stand there, have you, got? <laughs> you want to keep calm. If you're going to start causing too much trouble, if it gets too much on you, because it's make it rough. Well, Luke, you cautioned me about the uh, the disciplinary code where I could be held liable for bringing the service into disrepute. But it's in my opinion, it's not me bringing the service into disrepute. The people themselves are bringing the service into disrepute by ostracising us and refusing us facilities that are granted to virtually every other group of individuals who care to put the case forward. So why us in particular? What's wrong with that? I agree with you. Mm. I agree. But um, we should keep calm. 
because he only needs an excuse and you could be out. Luke, not being, he, he could ship you out, he could do anything he wanted. If you give him an excuse, oh, if you keep can. Well, this is not Victorian. It's, it might be a Victorian jail, but we're not Victorian damn jailers, no. But I don't think we can charge him with uh, disobedience to orders. Well, what's, what's this bottom one say? A few days later, John Sutton's challenge had become a direct one for Governor Brown and the Chief. He had appeared on a local television programme discussing his proposed new union, despite being officially forbidden to do so. The Governor is now determined to discipline him under prison rules. But which rule and on what charge? Correct neglects are without good sufficient cause first to prompt and generally do anything which is in his duty. Well, no, he's not neglect. That's under neglect of duty, sir. Mm. He's not neglecting his duty. I think that's the one we must do in Monday. Hey, disobedience of our... Yes, but before we make out the white house sheet, the discipline of those failing to obey an order is not in the discipline code. Don't challenge. Well, you're yeah, 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 charging disobedience to orders. You're mm. charging him. Mm. You're charging him. Disobeying the governor's order. Yeah. No. Disobedience to orders, oh. i.e., disobeyed a direct order given by the deputy That's the governor. Same. Without good and sufficient cause, fails to carry out any lawful order. But well, he was given a lawful order, order not to contact anybody yeah. without my authority. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So the ship's in a in a good theater, state. Eh? Despite warnings, possible disciplinary charges, and imminent expulsion from the POA, John Sutton is determined to go ahead with his inaugural meeting of the Prison Force Federation in a hall hired for the occasion in the centre of Manchester. <coughs> right, gentlemen, well, you can see the massive response we've had. I think this is Tenor Machine 1, John Sutton nil, but we're going to go ahead because I believe that we need it. And I'm standing here tonight as an honest man, and it's taken a lot of courage, I can tell you, because I'm up against it more than anybody else. I'm so far out on a limb that if, if they decide to have a go, I feel that I will be standing on my own. We've got to work in conditions that, uh, they face it, they're Dickensian, you? and uh, if we kept dogs in these places, three to a cell, without the ability to use proper facilities, and the RSPCA, <laughs> they would think that we were being cruel to animals, wouldn't they? Would a trade union allow its members to work in a place like this? Now, where are all these inmates going? They're being crammed into the jails and they're using people like you and me as mugs. The first official meeting of the Prison Force Federation was to be one of very few. For in a matter of months, it was dead and buried. John Sutton, as its inspiration, was not inspired enough. A mixture of apathy, suspicion and hostility defeated him. Sutton was expelled from the POA and was given an official warning from the governor about his behaviour. He still works in the prison. Yeah. The plaster off yesterday. Yeah. Do you know about him? No, I well, no, about yeah, him. Yeah, but he, he, he said he's got a bit of pain from it. Yeah. It's just he can't sleep. Yeah. So can you give us anything at all for him? Um, yeah, I'll give him something. Aspirin or something. Well, yeah, it says Lonnie, you know. Best looking, yeah. <laughs> or just best.
Now you'll feel no more pain. You'll be dead in an hour. They better not be. Okay. No problems. Okay, Mr. Baker, I think we need to grab these lads to go to sleep now. Now, I've had more communications from the special branch during the course of this morning. There's another two copies of another two adverts telling all the people who are interested where the demonstration is going to be and what time and so on and so forth. Again, no numbers have been forecast. Nobody can tell whether it's going to be six, 600 or 6,000. We don't know. And if you are subjected to any barracking or any abuse or any provoking at all, you know, if anybody has a go at you, do your best to ignore them. I can't stress it too highly. You're the ones that are being set up. It's the usual story. They try and show the black side of the prison service. So be aware of it. No! External political pressures are a growing fact of life for British prisons. It has resulted in a similar growth of security and surveillance within the prison system. It is a little known fact that most major prisons have a security officer liaising with various police forces and the Home Office. In strange ways, it is Jack Price. Uh, Zulu 10 receiving into us, over. Then would you cover the end of Alpha Wing returning uh, with Papa One to Delta One? Over. I receive. Will do. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's uh, somewhere I think possibly a hundred or more. Uh, well, at the moment, yeah, we had a, another faction of the NF, but they decided to disappear. I believe they've gone on to. Um, well, you know, there's no reason they'll probably blow out of steam eventually. There is a constant flow of information concerning prisoners regarded as subversive either in the criminal or political sense. Intelligence gathering is not just an activity on the outside, but also inside the walls. That's just a lot of twaddling. Yeah. The opening and censoring of prisoners' mail is morally justified by the authorities as being vital to security. Its avowed object is to uncover information that might expose more crime, as well as to identify any welfare problems a prisoner might have. It is hardly the most edifying part of a prison officer's job in strange ways. This practice is a major cause of resentment amongst inmates and has been condemned by many outside bodies, including academics and prisoners' organisations. Yeah. Is it the same fella? What's his, uh... What, they're wearing envelopes? Yeah. He's got a thing about bears. He's got a hang-up on bears. Well, uh, do you reckon it's one guy? Yeah, too much to eat, but to be different. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Let's see how that'll be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> the need for security results in the constant searching of inmates for illicit possessions. In a prison with well over a thousand prisoners, a continual watch is kept on trafficking in tobacco, money, 
drugs and implements that could be used as weapons. Cells are often turned over through information acquired by the security officers. They listen to any source, a prisoner with a grudge, a prisoner who is frightened, a prisoner who has become a grass. Prisoners rebel against their imprisonment in different ways. Some explode, some fight, or some, like this man, barricade their cell. Can somebody take these out through, please? Undoubtedly, the pressures and tensions of imprisonment are increased when two or three men share this living space, a cell devised in the Victorian age for one man. Right. May come in this door, may come in that door, may come in. Where's it happening here? No, false alarm. It could be a false alarm, anything. It could be trouble over in the shops, on the yard, or anything. Any one of three doors, it'll be there, there, or here. Somebody has rung uh, an alarm bell and it will register on a master board where the point of the trouble is. The, the running feet that you heard with the staff being sent to where the trouble area is. Hopefully we'll get a telephone call to warn us that somebody is coming down or to tell us what the trouble was. But until such times as that happens, we clear everything off and make cell space available in case it's, in case it's a rough do. <laughs> Some of the boys, I think. What are you doing, lad? Eh? Well, let's see you get on with it. Put that out. The threatened emergency proved to be a false alarm. Tension, anger, frustration, plus growing political awareness amongst prisoners has led to the sit-down or demonstration becoming a regular occurrence in British prisons. The added problem of overcrowding rising to alarming proportions has also increased the threat of another insurrection on the scale of the Hull riots. That event led to a major step by the authorities to combat a serious disturbance. The formation of Mufti teams, groups of prison officers especially trained in riot control, is a most important and controversial development within the prison service. 
they emerged without any public debate until their existence was revealed when a team was sent in to help prison staff quell a disturbance in Wormwood Scrubs prison. It has resulted in a full-scale police inquiry. One, one, last, clear. Expect the rubbish to come your way. Expect people to start hurling stuff at you. You've had it all before, and you'll get it all again. You'll hit the area that's a no-man's land, because they're not going to be drawn out too far. And when you consider it safe, away you go, form for the real institution. Come on, move it! Prison officers are given mufti instruction in strange ways, in readiness for a confrontation in this or any prison. All prison officers must now undergo this training. All right, good morning, gentlemen. <coughs> First of all, let me tell you why you're here this morning. We're going to sort of do the theoretical background to what is now popularly known as Mufti training. Mufti training, minimal use of force, tactical intervention. It sounds very grand. I think it used to be known as training for riot squads. Right, section leaders, fall in! Team, fall in! Great. Now that's another question. Some of you have got it off, some of you haven't. The riot stave will always, and I repeat, will always remain on your shoulder until such time that you engage the mob. It's for two reasons. A, it can clearly be seen. B, that you're not tripping your colleagues up on either side of you. Don't have it wandering around on your shoulder. All right? Now, it's a very emotive subject. And in many cases, we have been, indeed quite recently, we've been the subject of allegations and counter-allegations and investigations. Let me say this to you, that we, in my view, must carry on training. I think it's very necessary, simply because of the ground rules that are laid down. Now, the ground rules have been approved to the best of my knowledge and belief, by the Home Office, the Prison Department, and all the people who have that responsibility to Parliament. Three blasts, back, first team in. First team in, away you go, clear the area, form up at the rear. Don't forget the three short blasts, or whatever. One long blast. That's it. A tactical withdrawal. Keep yourselves formed up. Keep yourselves together. Don't forget, you're getting pelted with all kinds of stuff. It's coming your way. Bricks, slates, mortar, sinks, chairs, abuse, anything you can think of. Now, when you consider that you're in an area that's safe, a no man's land, break off and form up in the rear. Come on, move it. All of these movements, as far as you people in a section or a team are con uh, concerned, from your point of view, they will all be done in complete silence. It has been found by psychiatrists, psychologists and the like, that if you have a body of men coming towards you, togged up like something out of Star Wars and not one sound coming from them but them all reacting two words of command coming from the rear that this in itself 
is a very, very frightening object to be coming toward you. You'll see it in the gym. We are only playing at it here. We're only going through the motions. But I'll defy any of you to stand in front of a section of six men who are coming towards you, all tooled up. You know that they're coming to get you, and I want to see you stand there, because you've more bottle than I've got. So there we are, section, team, get that in your mind, team leader, and as I say, purely a Manchester sort of idea, a number two. The chief officer gives the rules, the ground rules, he tells them exactly what he wants, and if they don't obey those rules, then it's the governor's decision and his alone. It dispels this business of, you know, the idea of marauding squads of officers just going around willy-nilly. This does not occur. Right, just while you're having a bit of a respite, the riot stave. You know, again, this is the weapon that seems to create some kind of, I don't know, awe and mystery. Just so that you're in the picture, the average one is, uh, I think, 27 inches long and weighs 18 ounces. Nothing dramatic. The use of the riot stave, when you do use it, if you use it, you always aim for the upper arms and the upper legs. In other words, you catch them across there and there, or there, and the upper arm, and the upper legs. Okay. The reason for that is simply that if you've received a clout in the right place on your arms, you cannot use your arms effectively for several minutes. It doesn't cause permanent damage. That is not the game that we're in. Whatever retribution is coming the perpetrator's way is not for us to say. That's a matter for the governor and the judiciary. Let's face the facts. Let's get it down onto the nitty gritty. You're vulnerable. You'll always be vulnerable. And you're vulnerable to attack. You're vulnerable to weapons. You're vulnerable to assault. And more importantly, you're vulnerable to allegations. And this is why we insist on this high professional discipline training. It's the only way that we are going to win in any kind of confrontation situation. It's the only way that you as prison officers are going to come out of it and say, well, it was messy, but we controlled it. It was dangerous, but we got it so that we could manage it in our own way, in our own time. We are not the aggressors. In this situation, you are the controllers. But of course, in that controlling act, you've got to use carefully planned, carefully controlled, disciplined, force, hence the term mufti. Minimum use of force, and I'm told the other two initials are tactical intervention. So there you are. Think on it, gentlemen. An official police inquiry continues into alleged assaults by prison officers at Wormwood Scrubs. It has been confirmed. Mm -hmm.